So it's my great pleasure to so welcome just, yeah. an, old, an old friend back to UWS. We have Murray giving us a short series of two talks, and uh, Murray promised, and I'm sure that he'll keep his promise because I've heard him talk several times before, that the first talk is going to be understandable by everybody, and we'll get to the more technical details, uh, I hope, in two weeks. So we welcome Murray, who's telling us how to solve word equations. Thanks. Thank you, Falka. Um, yes, so I, I promise ooh, that this will be understandable, and the next talk will be totally un not understandable, so that's a good promise. So this is understandable. Ah. <laughs> uh -huh. This is joint work with Laura Chabana, who's at Neuchâtel, which is French for Newcastle, and uh, it's actually in Switzerland, and Volker Dicket, another Volker, is at Stuttgart. Um, so, let's get straight into it, um, but please stop me at any time with questions, things like that. So the talk's going to have a few quizzes and questions for you to do, so it's good that someone's got a pen and paper. So let's start the quiz. Two strings, are they the same? Box ticking. Coffee, so must be <laughs> well, you don't know my typing skills, my cut and paste. So what, so what I'm asking, first of all, I'm asking that question, but also you're probably thinking of some sort of algorithm. Maybe we're scanning them from right to left, put one string underneath the other one and try and pattern match. Um, any answers from... Okay, perfect. So one thing, there's four Bs here and there's three Bs there. So one approach would be, it's just A's and B's, so you could say look for some block, look for the big blocks of, you know, B's and compress them possibly into, you know, single things. Anyway, that's just the, the warm-up. Um, and in general, there's basically a linear time algorithm to answer a question like that. You just scan them. So the next part of the quiz is if we replace, uh, if we have an equation that looks like this, sorry, uh, yeah, an equation, because it's got an equals, and it's got variables in it. So now I'm not asking are they the same, I'm asking can you think of something to put for x so that they're the same? So, how about this? What could x be so that they look the same? BB, awesome. Okay, so this is a bit too trivial. Let's try another one. I have two variables now, x and y. Okay, you've got 20 seconds. <laughs> I haven't been teaching for a while because I'm on the Future Fellowship. So when I get back to teaching next year, maybe I'll, I'll need to do some courses. Cause... Okay, so this one. Now this is the problem that I'm going to talk about for today. Given a um, equation, just in these little symbols and variables, is there a way to assign the variables so that they match? Is there an algorithm to figure out how to find a solution or how to prove that there is no solution if that's the case? So any ideas for this one? Is there so one thing is four yeah. big... Sorry? Oh. I think we lost the sound. Can, can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, I thought you were going to give me the answer, but it dropped out. Well, one thing we could look at, we could try also the ad hoc things. Y has to start with A, because how are you going to get rid of the A? X has to end with B. And you can start playing sort of things like this. So that's what the talk's about. So you can leave now if you think that's, that's boring. I guess I have to um, give some real world reasons of why this is interesting. Um, and then try and tell you some history about who's thought about it before. And then whether or not there is such an algorithm to do this. 
So that's the plan. Okay, so now I'll just be a few formal sort of details because that's what you have to do. I've got an alphabet A and another alphabet omega. Oh, little letters and big letters. I'm going to define a word equation, which is the title of the talk, just to be an expression u equals v, where this notation just means you take any symbols out of those two sets. Star means any finite word in those symbols. So that's a word equation. It's what we've already been dealing with. A solution is an assignment of letters just in the A alphabet for each variable to make both sides identical. Okay, so back to this example. As we point, I want a solution for this. So here's one approach of how I go about solving these things. I know that I look at it and I, I know that Y has to start with an A. So I replace Y by, I've used the same symbol Y. Why? Because once I replace it, it's gone, so Y put a dash or something on it. So that's maybe a little confusing, but I don't want to be keep, as I do this process, I don't want to use too many variables, too many new symbols. So I do that replacement and then I say, well, the A's have to be the same, so knock them off. I also know that X has to end with a B, so I can do that replacement. And it seems to be getting worse. Um, now I look at it and X still has to end with a B, so I could do that again. And so this is a process that may go on forever. Um, and if you can think of a, a better way to do it, then I don't have to keep talking. Okay. So, that's the setup. So the problem that I'm interested in is given a word equation, is there an algorithm to decide if it has a solution or not? If, that, if you can answer that one, then the next question would be, well, is there an algorithm to find all solutions to the word equation? And then if you can answer that, then I want a concise, easy description of all solutions. <laughs> They're re fairly reasonable things to ask for, I think. Oh, I'm pointing at the screen. It's... Okay, so this one turns out has no solution. You might have worked that out. Um, I've got a little, I don't know if anyone can read it. My little reason of why this is true. Um, if you look at the suffix, bx and xb, they're the same length. Because nothing's cancelling or anything. It's just whatever I put for x, it's going to be there. So the suffix has the same length. And so therefore, they have to be the same word. If x ends with a b, and that over here, x starts with a b. So it has to be b, b, b all the way. You can, you can argue that. And then, um, so we know that x just has to be a power of b's. But then the a's are all messed up because x doesn't have any a's and there's only one A on the left-hand side, and you know why there's an even number. That's pretty ad hoc. So what I'm asking for above is a generic algorithm that works in general for any word equation. You don't have to muck around and look at it and say, oh, this, this, this. Um, and if there is such an algorithm, how efficient is it? Or can you make a better algorithm that's more efficient? So this is a quite an old problem, so I want to talk about you know where it comes from a little bit. But um, I hope that, I mean, I promised that the first talk would be understandable by everyone, and I think the problem's fairly straightforward. I could lie and pretend that it has some real-world application. Um, I mean, it does have real-world applications in computer science, but I don't know anything about that. I'm a pure mathematician. Um, but you can imagine, like, Someone gives you some DNA strands that sort of match together, but then they're corrupted and there's pieces missing. And so you're asking for that. So I need to work on my real-world applications to be a little more convincing that I know what I'm talking about. But as a pure problem, for me, I'm a pure mathematician, and if there's a problem that's easy to state 
and a bit tricky even just at the beginning here, that that's really appealing to me. So, um, are there any questions? Great. Okay, so let's ramp up the uh, abstraction a little bit and introduce things that uh, I know James will be able to handle, but I think everyone here can. Uh, just some fancy words for things. The free monoid of rank D is the set of all words over an alphabet with D letters. So we've already been dealing with this object because when I've been talking about words. Um, and it's an, it's an algebraic thing, so it's a set with some operation, and the operation is just take two words and stick them together, and you get another word which is in the set. So that's just called a monoid, a free monoid. So <laughs> this is my trivial exact exercise to continue the quiz, that if you've got two elements of this monoid, the operation is you just stick them together. Easy. You already know a monoid, the monoid of rank, three monoid of rank one, the set of all words just over a single symbol. So you can have zero of the symbol, and that's in it. Or you can have one or two or three. And if you've got a string of length three and a string of length five and you stick them together, you get string of length eight. So this is just the natural numbers with addition instead of star. So the free monoid is pretty easy, and that's, I'll go back, and that's what we're um, talking about. We're saying, can you substitute elements of the free monoid for these variables and get an equation which is true in the monoid? It's a fancy way to say what I've already said. So then we can go to the, the next thing in algebra that you might go to is a free group, and the only difference is um, the alphabet that we're looking at has inverses to the symbols. So A1 and A1 inverse, and we're looking at all words over these symbols, but we're not interested in the monoid, we're interested in what's called the free group, which is a set of all reduced words. So we're not allowed AA inverse next to each other. Otherwise, we just have the monoid again. Um, and the operation is you take two strings that are reduced to begin with, and you stick them together, but then you have to reduce them so that they land back inside the group. So exercise number five is um, stick them together, and what's going to happen? You have to get rid of the middle, get rid of, get rid of. Okay. I claim you already know the free group of rank one. It's a set of all reduced words over a symbol, and it's negative. Right, one and right, one inverse, and when we stick them together, they cancel out if it's a positive and a negative. Otherwise, they add together. So that's there. Okay. All right. So that's the free group, and um, it's a fairly fundamental object um, in group theory, obviously, and in algebra. Um, so. I wanted to sneak it in um, and talk about equations in free groups rather than equations in free monoids is what we were talking about before. So this time our alphabet uh, have inverses with them. And we're going to have an equation which is just going to be a expression u equals v where we've got inverses. And we're asking for an assignment of the x and the y with reduced words so that when you substitute them in after cancellation they look exactly the same so a little bit more you're not just saying so i'm not going to be able to use my tricks to say look the suffix has to have the same length because the suffix you could substitute and it could cancel so this problem of finding a solution to an equation of free group sounds maybe a little bit harder because you've got a lot more options um, so I've got exactly the same equation. You don't have to have inverses in the equation, but you can still say find solutions that have inverses in them. And so this time I could, if I want to, I could make this as a guess as well. I could also guess that x, that y starts with a. That would be one way to go, like we did before. 
but I could guess that x starts with a inverse, and now that will get rid of the a at the front. So it's a different problem. Maybe it sounds a little bit harder than the original problem because there's a lot more to think about. And again, I've chosen an equation that um, if you don't want to listen to my talk with all my trivial exercises that I've been giving you, <laughs> insulting all your intelligence, you might just write down the equation and just go mad on it and try and work it out. So, um, I mean, people came up with these Sudoku puzzles and are they rich or something? From Do they get a royalty for doing it? I mean, could you imagine putting in the MX or whatever it's called here, an equation in a free group and everyone's on the train trying to solve it? I think I should, yeah. But I'll patent it first. I'll tell, tell the Newcastle, you know, innovation, I think they're called. Okay, so they're the two problems that I'm just presenting without much real-world motivation, but I think they're interesting problems. Given, a, given an equation now over a free group, um, decide if it has a solution, tell me all the solutions, and if you can do that, how, you know, make it efficient, give a really uh, nice description. Obviously, number one is what you want to be doing first rather than all these extra things. Um, okay. Oop. A blank screen in case you want to. And I will put these notes on my web page, um, and I think the lecture is being recorded, but... Um, And also, what I'm talking about is, is a paper on the archive as well. So. Okay. So, um, rather than dive straight into how to solve these things, which I'm really into, because we know how to do it, um, and we're not the first, per pe first people to be able to do this, it goes back a long way, and the first dot point was already known um, in the 70s. So I want to give not real-world applications of this stuff, but just a context of within other areas of pure mathematics where um, equations come up. So let me tell you about one more group. Um, and I claim that's all you need to know is a free monoid, free group, and now I'm talking about the free abelian group. Um, free abelian group of rank D is a set of all uh, tuples of integers with the operation of just adding coordinate wise. So just like the Z that we had before as a free group of rank one, um, I think I've got an exercise for everybody. Um, I've got two tuples of integers and I have to add coordinate wise. So the answer is three, zero, dot, 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 dot. Easy, okay. <laughs> Um, so we can talk about, we can call it ZD because that's the tradition. Um, and we can say that it's generated, this is like having a basis or something. Um, it's generated just by these elements. If you take all of these guys and their inverses, which would have a minus one everywhere, it's implicit when we say generated in a group. We take all these guys and add as many times as you want, you can get any tuple of integers with negatives. So we say that's generated. Just like the free group that we talked about before was generated by those little a's, you just stick them together as many times as you want. So I want to um, compare different groups with each other. So I want to sort of have a standard way to talk about them all. I don't want to talk about the integers as tuples and the free group as words that are reduced. I want them all to kind of be the same looking thing. So Instead of writing them as tuples, I can take Z2, which is generated by 1, 0, and 0, 1, and instead of writing them as tuples, I'll just call it A and B. And instead of doing plus, which is what you would expect, 1, 0, and 0, 1, when you add them together, you get the element 1, 1. But if you did BA, which is the other way around, you'd still get 1, 1. So what I'm trying to do is this was the group that I started with, but I want to write it 
so it looks just like a generic group like the free group does. In the free group, A, B, and B, A are different words. They're reduced things, and they're different. But in Z, they're the same. So these are very, um, they're called the free groups, free group and free abelian group, because there's not much else going on apart from the minimum you need to be to be a group or to be an abelian group. Okay. Oh. So, um, Alfred Tarski, famous for various cool things. Um, one of the things he was interested in was the first order theory of a group. And what it is, sounds maybe a bit scary, but it's the set of all first order sentences that are true in the group. So, first order sentence, whatever that is, it's first order logic, is um, you're allowed for all and there exists, and then you're just allowed some statement in logic. So I'm not defining it, I'm just giving you some examples. So this is a sentence in first order logic, and is it true in the free group of rank one? If I take a A to some power and A to another power, they switch between. So this statement is true for Z and for ZD, um, but it's not true for the free group of rank two and above. So the first order theory of free groups is different to the first order theory of free abelian groups. Here's another sentence. Um, it's got an implication, so that's the sort of thing that we can expect. Well, it implies that they commute. Well, it's still true in these abelian groups. This time, it turns out, um, I think this goes back to Lyndon, a group theorist, um, who asked whether this is true for all free groups. And it is. What it says, if you've got a word, a reduced word in a free group, and you write it twice, well, it might cancel a bit in the middle, and then you write another reduced word, and it might cancel a bit. And then you write another reduced word and double it, and it might cancel a bit. If it all cancels down to one, I'm calling one the word with nothing in it. That's, that's okay. So if everything cancels down to one, it must be that the X and the Y commute. It's a bit of a weird sentence, really, because it doesn't say anything about the Z at the end of the day. So it turns out, I think, Lyndon, I need to look up all my, my history, but um, one of the old group theorists anyway from last century realised that this sort of seems true for all the free groups, and, and Tarski was interested in whether you could distinguish all the different groups by the sentences which are true, if you could tell them apart. Um, and this sentence is kind of a cool one, because it turns out, so why would they commute? Well, they'd have to be exactly the same letter to different powers. This would have to be A to the something, Y would be A to the something, and then Z would be A to the minus something, you know, the appropriate thing. So it would work. And if X, Y, or Z had A's and B's in it, there's no way it could work, is basically what it's saying. So I'm taking you off on a tangent, and... Um, First order theory has got a lot more going on than just equations and whether you can solve an equation because these for alls and there exists as well. So it's a little more full on. But in order to tackle this tasky question that I'm going to put next, you need to at least be able to understand how to deal with equations over groups and whether they have a solution. So the last one I might just leave as a homework exercise because it will take up a, a bit of my time, um, but it's a very cool thing which goes back to Tarski, um, it's pretty complicated looking, um, and it turns out this one is true for the free group, free abelian group of rank two, but not three or four or five of them. And you can get one of these equations, so I can explain why it is, it's kind of cool. Um, so Tarski knew from this last example that you could tell all the different free abelian groups apart, you could tell whether you were rank had two generators or three or four, just with this equation. Which means if you write down all the equations which are true, there could be infinitely many, there will be, 
all the equations which are true for my group, it'll be different to all the equations that are true for the next group. And his question was that I know how to deal with free abelian groups. Well, what about free groups? Are there equations that are true for one free group and not another? So that's an old question. It's kind of a, a bit hard to explain to someone at a party or something. But I think, I hope that I've communicated it. That um, I think it's an intriguing sort of thing to ask. Okay, so one more bit of like um, culture. So Diophantine equation, this goes even further back to Diophantus. Um, a Diophantine equation, nothing to do with groups anymore, a priori, um, is a polynomial over some variables with integer coefficients and you're asking, so the, it's just an equation really, but then it's a Diophantine equation if you're asking for only integer solutions. And the most famous one is this one. Does anyone know what it's, where this is famous? It's Fermat's last theorem. Apparently Fermat was reading Diophantine's book about these types of equations and wrote in the, that's where he wrote in the margin, that, oh yeah, this one doesn't have a solution. So yeah, that's a Diophantine equation. Um, so why am I talking about these? Hilbert's tenth problem asked whether there was an algorithm to decide, to decide whether a Diophantine equation has a solution. I'm asking about word problems, which are word, what are they called? Word equations, which are totally different to this in groups. Um, so that was one of Hilbert's problems. And so Hilbert's problems go back to the 1900. In the 1960s, I think in Russia, it was realized that if you could, that the problem of deciding whether a word equation had a solution could be reduced into a Diophantine system, which you're then asking. So if Hilbert's question had a positive answer, if there was an algorithm to solve a Diophantine system, you could use it to solve our word problem system. I keep calling it word problem. Our word equation system. So the word equations, maybe they look a bit easier because you don't have these powers and pluses. It's just over a, a monoid. There's hardly anything going on. And I've written, for the purpose of anyone going back through the slides later, a very brief reason of why this is true because it's not a direct thing. You, you represent the monoid elements as matrices. And then you set up the word equation as an equation over matrices. And so each position in the matrix is a Diophantine equation all by itself. And there's a few extra conditions. So that's kind of a cool thing, um, I think. So you're trying to solve word equations, so you embed it into some maybe harder problem. And if you could solve the harder problem, bingo, you'll solve the easier problem. So what was thought rather than this would be a way to solve word equations, it was thought this would be a way to prove the harder Diophantine question was undecidable. If you could give a nice proof that word equations was undecidable, there's no way Diophantine equations can be decidable. There's no way there can be an algorithm for Diophantine equations because you could use that to solve word equations. So that was the strategy. So Around the 60s, there was a lot of work going on in these word equations because if, as you saw my very first example, it seemed very hard. Has anyone figured it out? Oh, yeah, we did figure it out. So. No, my first example, we figured out there were no solutions over the monoid. In other words, just old, ordinary old word equations. But in the free group, we still don't know whether there are solutions. It might not be true the other way around. Though. That's correct. That you mean that the word equations... Solvable? Yeah. Unless we had some reduction, but we don't. In fact, Sanjita is preempting. I'll put them both on. You're exactly right. That's what turned out. That in the 70, 1970, Matt that's, that's Savich, building on a series of work, um, proved that Hilbert's 10th problem is undecidable. And that proof is hardcore logic and number theory. Nothing to do with word equations whatsoever. Um, so that kind of kills my previous slide. 
because that's useless for what we want to do with word equations. But then this was supposed to appear, you know, secretly next. McCannon didn't give up. He was still interested in the problem anyway. And he proved he gave an algorithm to decide whether a word equation has a solution in 1977. So it's exactly, as you say, Sanjita, that it could be true that one's undecidable and the other, and it's exactly the way it turned out. So maybe I should stop the talk there. The McCannon solved it. Go and read his paper in Russian and you'll, you'll be perfectly satisfied of how to do it. Um, this is for you, James. Um, 79, um, I haven't defined what a free inverse semigroup is and I only threw this in after I talked to James a day ago. Um, Rosenblatt decided that equations over these objects, which are a little bit close to free groups and free monoids in some sense, the, there, if you step that way, the problem becomes undecidable, solving word equations. And then in 82, McCannon kept working away. He gave, he adapted his algorithm to give an algorithm for the free group as well, for equations over free groups, to prove that they are decidable. So it's really weird. It means I don't understand anything about free and reverse semigroups because there is a way to answer a word equation over a free group, which McCannon came up with. Um, but if you step off to the side, things become undecidable. So it's, it's, I claim it's kind of interesting stuff. <laughs> I hope you agree with me. I like it anyway. Um, and McCannon stuff is really, really difficult. 77 and people are still grappling with what's going on there. Um, but in a nutshell, I mean, I found this on descriptions of his algorithm. It's a really popular algorithm in computer science because it's such a hard algorithm to do something. Um, McCannon essentially proved that if an equation, whether we're in a group or a monoid, or I'm just being vague, if an equation of length n has a solution, the substitutions, then what he proved was that there is a solution that's sufficiently small. Sufficiently small so that the length of each UI is less than gamma n. The capital gamma should always send shivers down your spine. It's going to be some horrible thing. Whenever that comes out in Mathematica, you're like, oh, no, it's going to be something terrible. And it is. Gamma is a horrible function. It's a recursive function, so you can compute what it is, but it's bigger than Ackerman's function. Um, and so given this sentence, if you believe if you believe just this sentence, um, you do have an algorithm to solve word equations. You look at your word equation and you try every possible substitution without thinking up to this length. And this length is bigger than Ackerman's function. And so obviously you're never going to be able to do this to solve the equation. But it's decidable. So do we stop or do we keep going and say, is there a better way to find solutions? Um, the algorithms that he came up with are extremely inefficient. He didn't do the complexity analysis back in 77. That wasn't cool. But since then, people were interested in what's going on. And one of the first analyses of the algorithm as he gave it was that that was the time complexity. And, um, and then later on, as people modified the algorithm a tiny bit, they proved that you could do it using exponential space which is a different measure of complexity, um, how much memory you would need on the computer. So exponential space is a bit out there. You, it's not something you could practically do. It's kind of a... Um, so it's a famous algorithm because it's just so hard, but it does something practical. But you can invent algorithms that are some Turing machine thing that are just really... But it's all very um, made up. This is a genuine, a word equation is, I, it's pretty abstract too, but it's a fairly concrete question, and that's why it's interesting. So in 87, Razborov, his PhD thesis, modified the McCannon algorithms to find all the solutions. McCannon just said, if there's a solution, there has to be this small one, and then stop, because you know the answer. But 
Um, you could push it a bit and say, well, you find the small ones and then you rev them up somehow. And there's a systematic way that you can get all the solutions just from the small. But it's just similarly complicated. Um, so more answers. Because um, I put all these cultural things like the Tarski and Diophantine. So I wanna, I've want to i answered the Diophantine thing. Let's go back to the Tarski questions. Salah and independently Kalampovich and Miasnikov proved that the non-abelian free groups, so the ones of rank 2 and above, have the same first-order theorem. So it's, I think it's an amazing conceptual thing that you can't write down sentences that distinguish what, what group you're in. These proofs um, are complicated. Oh, and um, in addition, Kalin Povich and Miazikov also proved that the first order theory for the free group is decidable, which is a different question. You can say whether all the sentences are different or not without actually figuring out what all the sentences are. And so the second result is that if I give you a sentence, there's an algorithm to say, yes, that's in the theory, that's true for this free group or not. I don't know if anyone follows um, the archive wars very closely, things that go on on the archive. But, um, oh, so, yeah, so they use completely different approaches. And both papers, neither parties kind of believe the other author's versions. And they've been writing papers on the archive, tearing shreds off each other about all the mistakes in each other's paper. It's kind of fascinating. They're all lovely people, um, I think, <laughs> unless you try and prove a different proof of uh, the Tarski problem. So one of, the, one of the issues here, I mean, these approaches are so technical and they rely, first of all, on being able to understand equations and then worry about the first order theory, the logic afterwards. And so they're relying on this McCannon thing, which is just an, this horrible nightmare. So I'm trying to motivate that it's not ridiculous of me to still be working on this stuff, even though it's all been kind of resolved, that what we want is to answer those other, the third dot point. Is there a nice, easy, simple way to figure out what the solutions are? Not just decide with some horrendous algorithm. Okay, so I'm not the only one. There's a series of people, mostly in computer science, um, that were interested in trying different things to to dis decide whether a word equation has solutions. Plandowski and then Plandowski and Ritter um, came up with a completely different approach to solve these word equations using ideas from data compression in computer science. And they managed to prove that you could not just solve it in exponential space like McCannon's, because he's running off trying every possible thing. They use data compression to be really careful about the space that they use, the memory that they use. And so we've already seen a glimpse of their approach when I started substituting the equation. I started with an equation and I said, I think it starts with A. I think Y starts with B. And I started subbing in. And I tried to cut a few things off when I could. In the group case, in the, in the monoid case, I, I just chopped things off the front. That's essentially what the approach is here. They make lots of substitutions, but then they end up with all these letters in the equation. The equation starts length n. If you start making a million substitutions, suddenly the equation is length a million plus n or the million times n, because x could appear n times. So you need to do something so that the algorithm that you're doing here, the very naive idea, doesn't explode. So very quickly we turn from anything to do with group theory and algebra to just considerations of computer science and just keeping space consumption down. So that was kind of a revelation. Um, Does that affect the time complexity? Yeah, you can work out, it's still exponential time, but it's singly exponential time now. But the original thing is like triply exponential or something, but yeah, 
exactly. But I'm focusing mainly on space, but yeah, you, you get a much better algorithm that way too. Still exponential. Um, and since then, I, I didn't want to give everybody the credit that they deserve. <laughs> I want to, but I didn't want to use my slides. Um, a bunch of people in computer science used this idea, improved it, tweaked it, extended it to the free group case as well. Um, and this is when I came along with my collaborator, Laura Chabano, because we were interested in giving a description of all solutions. We looked through the literature. There's the McCannon literature, which has also been developed during this time, and we couldn't understand it. We tried. We saw this computer science literature, which seemed to be answering the questions we wanted, because it seemed much more tractable what they were talking about. One problem is, Laura and I are pure mathematicians, and reading these computer science papers that are extended abstracts for conference proceedings, they don't give any details or proofs. They just make grand assertions. So um, what we did is commandeered one of these computer scientists, Volker Dicke, and got him to... I actually went to Stuttgart and planted myself there for a few weeks and didn't leave until he tried... I explained to me how things worked. And um, so the most recent up until we came along result is Plandowski, Yeish, and Dicke. They boiled it down to a non-deterministic space quadratic algorithm to solve equation over free groups or free monoliths. So that's where we came along. We found this paper and we're like, this is what we need to give a really good description. They were just interested in deciding whether things, not giving all solutions, the other dot points, they're just interested in the first dot point. So the result that I am here to announce, and then next time try and give some details of the proof, um, is joint with my collaborators. We didn't intend to try and improve the space complexity, but we got it down to what's called quasi-linear space in some circles, an n log n non-determinist algorithm to find all solutions over a free group or a free monoid. And I've mentioned something about constraints here, which I'll talk about next time. Um, our purpose of this work was to not just decide whether there's a solution or even to find all the solutions, but we wanted to give a description of all solutions as a really nice object. In, and where our bias is formal language theory, so we wanted to describe the set of all solutions as a really nice formal language. So what we mean by that is something like context-free or context-sensitive, if you know what those words are. That was our approach. And so by trying to use all this um, literature, which we're sort of describing how to get all the solutions, we want to convert that into a formal language description. And by doing that, we ended up improving all the, the approaches. And so I won't talk about formal language theory in these talks, even though that was the whole motivation for us doing it, um, it turned out that we were able to show that the set of all solutions to an equation lies in this language class called EDTOL, which was invented by a biologist, who was Lindenmeyer, who was trying to just describe the growth of algae in trees and things like that. Um, so that's our result, and plan for the rest of the talk. So it's 4.46, and so let's see how my timing is here. Um, I just want to give a glimpse of the idea of the proof, this compression that was initiated by Landowski, and maybe it'll completely put you off from coming to my next installment in two weeks' time. And then that's this good service that I'm doing to you, saving you. So, um, and then my talk next time... I want to focus on the guts of the, the proof because there's some interesting ideas there. Certainly not all coming from just me and my collaborators, but from this big history starting with Plandowski and ignoring McCannon, I had to say, because it's just we're completely going on a different direction than McCannon. So um, we reduce the first dot point here. Um, I'll talk start with next time. The problem in free groups I tried to make out was going to be harder. 
because you've got all these inverses that can cancel. But we've got a reduction. Given an equation in a free group, you can convert it to some other system of equations just over a monoid. And so with constraints. So I have to tell you what these constraints are. So that's kind of a cool step. And then we have to just prove a theorem about solving equations just over free monoids with constraints. Um, and then our description is just in terms of a finite graph. We've given an equation, we can build a finite graph which has exponential size in the num in the size of the length of the input, the length of the equation. So we can give it an equation, we've got this really well, it's a non-deterministic low space algorithm which just builds this graph. And every solution is sitting there inside the graph. There's infinitely many solutions often, but they're all sitting inside the graph. So that's what I'm going to talk about next time. So I want to finish. If, if I, I can take just a few more minutes um, with a sketchy idea of what the compression is all about. So we want it to work for any possible equation. I've got one there just so we can look at it. But we don't want to be looking at the equation and going, oh, it starts with an A, blah, blah, blah. This has to work every single time. So what we do is we make all possible guesses of substitutions. You don't try and be clever. You say maybe X starts with an A, maybe it starts with a B or a C. You just make all possible choices. So there's non-deterministic problem. We guess just the first and last letters of the variables. And then sometimes we'll guess we're done. So if we're going to do the substitution X turns into AX, like I did at the start, eventually I might say, well, the X that I've got left now just replace it by nothing. If there's a solution, you should be able to get it by doing that. Like a, a million monkeys at typewriters will find the solution. But it's just, they'll take forever. You, there's no guarantee. If there's no solution, you've got no way of knowing the monkeys can stop time. So we do things like substitute ran for no reason whatsoever, which makes the equation longer. We're in a monoid. With, I'm going to tell you how to get rid of the group considerations and just deal with a monoid. So there's no cancellations ever going to occur. So what's going to happen after you do this random well, or non-deterministic guessing, you're going to end up with really long equations. And if you guess x and y equals nothing, you'll end up with two words that are either identical or not identical, and you can stop. Um, the problem with it, as I've said, is that the equations get really, really long. But notice that the way that I'm doing the substitutions, and I'm rewriting the y as y instead of doing y prime, which would seem more sensible. I do the substitution, the variables stay put, or maybe they, some of them disappear. So I've got these really long words with the same number of variables. So what's getting long is the bit in between the variables, which are just words over the little letters. So we need to do something to compress. Well, what we do is compress not the variables, but just these things we call the constants. We compress them so that they shrink down and so that the equation gets back to the size that it started to, or big O of the size that it started to. And so this way, you could keep substituting forever. And, you know, you could sub if the first solution by McCannon, we, we kind of secretly know that if there's a solution, then the first one has size less than his crazy recursive function. So possibly, you need to do this substituting up to 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the 2 before you'll find the solution, which means that if you didn't do compression, the equation would get length 2 to the 2 to the 2 before anything would happen. So we do the compression, um, which I'll show on the next slide, Basically, you can do things like turn AA into a single letter, which I'll call A subscript 2. Or you could turn AB into a new letter called C, and it will just bring it down, which is how you compress a file, like a zip file. You've got a, a, zip file, a, a, a document of text, and it scans through and just compresses the down to a single thing. 
and then eventually we substitute. We say, all right, I'm done. And when you're done, you'll be left with two words which we just scan and we know whether they're the same or not. So it's very naive what I've got here. The issues are, is it, how do you ever know when, if you've searched long enough? And that's the trick to the proof. It's not that there's some clever thing which McCannon uses all this clever stuff. We're doing something very naive. Substitute until you stumble upon the solution of a dead end. This will just lead to dead ends most of the time. Um, oh, and because we kept rewriting X as X, we keep a, a track of all the things that we do. And so that if you actually, you get to the end and you've got nothing left, you haven't got any variables left. So you go back through all the substitutions that you made and you recover the solution. Okay. Um, and so we represent the process that I've described here by a finite directed graph, um, which I'll go into next time, so I should wrap up. The, the um, graph is just going to encode the solutions and you can backtrack through to find them. Um, here are the compressions. These are the only ones we use. Different people use a different thing. We compress pairs down to single letters and blocks of arbitrary length of the same letter down to one pair. But what this means is that the length of the equation is going to grow and then shrink, but then the alphabet of constants that we're using also needs to grow. And we don't want that to grow arbitrarily big either. So it's a balancing act. So it's really all about space complexity, this algorithm. It's a balancing act between using lots of compression, which involves lots of symbols, um, but then once you shrink an equation down to a certain length, you don't need all the symbols because you need as many symbols as there are length of the equation. So to ensure the graph is finite so that we've got, and that's going to be our description, we use and reuse finitely many constants and we have a global bound on the length of the intermediate equation and we prove that this doesn't lose any solutions that might be lurking. So that was supposed to either put you off or intrigue you to come next time. And um, I hope I've just explained what the problem is, a little bit of the history, and then this is where I'm at. Like, I'm totally focused on how to solve the problem that we have. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Murray. Uh, could we go back to your last slide, please? Yes. Um, do you have to keep track of all the uh, substitu uh, not substitutions of all the definitions of new uh, yes. constants here? Yes, we certainly do, and because that will be the way we recover the solution. And how do you how do you scan uh, with the two uh, once you've replaced the variables by the empty empty word? Yeah. Um, could it happen that you've got the same strings in the original uh, letters, but not the same strings in your substituted letters? So, I mean, could, for example, could you get, uh, trivial example, could you get the left-hand side equal to AB and the right-hand side equal to the CAB? Right, yeah, so that they're, they are actually equal, but they don't look the same. Exactly. Yes, no, we have to do a cleaning up procedure all the time as we go through. Right. So there's lots of technical things, but yeah. So some sort of novel form or, uh, Just basically a cleaning up of the variables, the, of the letters that we're using. Um, so the graph is going to, I didn't say what the edges were labeled by, but they're labeled by all these different homomorphisms that we apply. Um, but as I was saying, um, you do the substitutions and grow the word, but at the same of the equation, and at the same time, then you do some compressions which shrink the word. That introduces a lot of the extra letters. But if you shrink the word down to just, you know, some constant times the original length, you only need as many letters as you can see in the word. So, you, your alphabet that you created to do this contains a lot of letters that are no longer in use. 
But okay, maybe let me rephrase my question. Yeah. Um, is the is the group slash monoid generated by your new symbols free? No. No, that's a really good point. It, we actually introduced commutation because, for example, we might rename the letter A as something else. Yeah. I mean, it's a bit weird to do it, but we do things like that. Certainly, B4 commutes with B. So that's um, fantastic that you picked that up, that um, we start with a free monoid, and then once we start doing our compressions, we move out into a monoid that's got relations. Uh, so you basically have to have to be able to solve the word problem in that new monoid. Right? Exactly, exactly. But it's not too hard because it's just a partially commutative monoid. And in fact, the cleaning up procedure gets rid of things, two things for the same, two names for the same element, things like that. But exactly right. So it does get. We actually do do algebra even though I was pretending that I don't know anything about algebra. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Not a mathematical one. Well, can we go to the next one? Uh-huh. Well, that's in deference to my EDTOL system, which I didn't explain to you, but yeah. I like the photo. Yeah. And it sort of matches the color scheme of my Beamer. further questions and thank you very much for an excellent talk. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in two weeks again. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Murray. Oh. It's Leanne at Penrose. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Leanne. Hi, Leanne.